Hey, Dilby here. I'm in my studio in Berlin. And what I want to do today is walk you through my new track, Clown Dance. It's out now on Supernova's Downtown Underground label. And it's been doing really well on Beatport and TrackSource, which is really exciting. It's always nice to get that uh, feedback and see that people are enjoying something that I've created. So this is just my way of giving something back to all those people that support my music. What I'm going to do is go through track by track and show you how the song is made up, um, what the different elements are, and how I've processed and produced all of those different parts to make up the, the record. Clown Dance is actually a really simple track, and what I want you to take away from this is that a record doesn't need to be complicated or overproduced in order to be functional on the dance floor and to do well in the charts. Basically the track is built around a main theme, and all of the elements that I've added have been selected to work around that main theme and to develop that into a full record. It's a big part of my production process to come into the studio with a clear idea of what I want to create. That really helps to streamline my workflow process and make sure that I'm always working towards the end result, which is a finished record. Every producer has that situation where you're just stuck with an 8 bar or 16 bar loop and don't know where to go from there in the track. I learned over the years that the, the easiest way to overcome that is by being prepared like mentally in advance, um, knowing what it is that you're trying to achieve and what you want the end result to be. I find that allows me to come into the studio and work quickly and efficiently. Anyway, enough of that, let's jump into Ableton and I'll walk you through the record. All right, so here we are inside of Ableton. Now, the f first thing you'll notice about this project is it's actually really simple. Um, the whole track really revolves around this kind of main disco sample, which is kind of the providing the theme of the track. It comes from like a full old disco record. The idea that I had when I came into the studio to make it was um, basically I'd found this cool sample which I wanted to flip into like a filtered disco house record um, kind of like a bit of a throwback sound but done with kind of modern punchy big production techniques and I did this project super quick basically I think I went I was DJing that night and I went into the studio in the morning and I think this probably came together in somewhere between four and six hours, and I played it out that night. What you're going to see from this project is, um, what I really want you to take away from it, is that a track doesn't need to be complicated to work. And in fact, um, the more simple the idea and the, and the kind of, or the more simple the production, um, it kind of ends up being a stronger track because you've got this strong main idea and everything is working to support that idea. Anyway, that said, let's get into the breakdown of the track. We'll start with the kick and the bass. So a big punchy kick and this um, filtered disco sample for the bass line. So this sample here is kind of providing the basis of the track. Um, it's like a full, it's a full disco record. It's got drums, um, instrumentation, vocal, everything in it so what i've used it for here is the bass line and the way that i've done that is i've filtered out a little bit of the um, the extreme sub with um, an eq here i'm pumping up a bit of the low mids and a bit of the um, upper kind of sub harmonics because i'm i want this to be acting as a bass line and it's got a lot of other content in there. It's also an old record, and old records weren't produced 
in the same way. They didn't have as much compression, as much limiting, and they didn't. They definitely didn't have as much low end, um, or as much emphasis on low end as a modern um, house record does. So I've just kind of pumped up that those frequencies a bit, so the bass punches through. Then I'm using a compressor here to really slam the um, slam the signal and kind of push everything together. Um, which again is just going to make sure that because it's it's like a live bass play being played, which has um, a lot of dynamics. And what we what I want from this is just a really strong, solid low end. But with that, still that kind of disco vibe and that disco groove. So, um, yeah, there's the compressor. Then I've got a Waves R bass, which is adding some harmonics in the low mids and then of course a filter which is cutting off the um, high frequencies so that we're just hearing the bass um, this is being automated throughout the track to open up the um, open up the cutoff and allow more of those um, high frequencies through that kind of that that automation that goes through the record just kind of helps to create flow and um, build up tension and release um, in the record and that really kind of transitions through all the different sections. Now then I've got a LFO tool which is basically just side chaining away the kick because there's a kick in the original sample. So without the LFO tool, uh, sorry, next up I've got a low cut filter which is just in the in these break sections. Um, here, here, it is just taking out the low frequency on the bass to create dynamics for those breakdown sections. Now if I play it without the LFO tool, you'll hear it's the kick is the loudest, loudest part of this. You can hear I'll show you what the I'll show you what the compressor is doing as well. So there's a lot more dynamics. The the kick drum is really the main focus of the low end, and the bass is a bit more low um, lower in the mix. But by using this this crazy um, loud compression, I'm able to push the bass like the actual played bass line. Um, a bit louder in the mix but this is also pushing the kick louder um, so to duck that out of the way I use the sidechain from the LFO tool so now we've just got a grooving disco bass line um, supplementary to that disco bass line I've got a a few uh, additional notes which are just being played from Omnisphere and this is just like an FM bass sound I've taken away the um, I've filtered out the the high frequencies done some absolutely ridiculous EQing here um, looks a bit unnecessary I like I said I just did this record super fast and then didn't really go back and change much um, other than the mix. Uh, so it looks like I've just I've done that to get the sound that I want. I've taken away the like 8.5 dB of gain because this is bo boosting a lot in the low frequencies. Um, so I've just I've done that in order to make the overall volume the same. So it's just kind of changing the sound. I've added a bit of overdrive to create some more upper harmonics and distort it a bit. And then I've got the same low cut there and the same um, side chain, which is just ducking it out when the kick's playing. So both of those together. So that FM bass just kind of provides a bit more of a focused bass sound and a bit more of a groove that's turning around at the end of each bar. Um, 
on its own, it really wouldn't be enough to support a theme for the whole for a whole record. But in this case, it's just like supplementary and just helping to provide groove to that main um, main disco bass theme of the of the track. Now let's go and have a look at the kick drum. So that's you know a big chunky um, raw kick drum sound. That's being made up of two kick samples. The first one is a subby part, and then there's a top that I've sampled from someone else's track. <laughs> um, yeah. Whatever works works. Um, now, so then, so on this top sound, I've just EQ'd out all the low frequencies because that's coming from the other kick. Obviously, that kick's big and boomy, but it doesn't um, it doesn't have a lot of, a lot of punch to it in the top end to make it um, to make it stand out on small speakers and to really punch through the record. Um, that's, so that's why I've got both of them. They're being processed together in this group uh, with an Ableton drum bus, which is just providing some saturation and uh, compression. It also, if you're using this device, be careful because it adds a lot of gain. So it's always important to uh, bring down the output, um, just the default setting adds about 5 or 6 dBs of, of gain, so make sure if you use it, you always pull down the threshold, uh, pull, sorry, pull down the output. Okay, next up on the kick, I've got an EQ here, which is just rolling off a bit of the tops, I think from that top kick sound, there's a tambourine in there, and I think it was just poking through a little bit harsh and kind of all of those high frequencies were adding up with the, when um, it's played together with the hats. And then I've got a little boost here at 98 hertz, which the re now the, the way I came up with that 98 hertz is that the fundamental frequency of the kick is here at 49 so that's playing the key of G so what I've done is the next harmonic up is going to be at that 98 Hertz so I'm just giving it a tiny little boost almost 2 dB um, with quite a narrow Q and what I'm doing there is pushing that through the mix a little bit and now you'll see in the bass I'm doing the opposite and just pulling out a little bit. So that just allows the kick to poke through um, against the bass. So I play those together. So as you can hear, those, are, those two elements are sitting quite nicely together in the mix. For this record, the drums are really playing a supporting role. Everything's just designed to get that warm, fat vibe of the kind of disco house sound. Um, so the drums are really there to support the main sample. So that said, let's have a look. We've got some clap and snare tracks here. Cool. So there's just a few different samples laid on top of each other, and then we've got there's two two clap sounds, okay, a nice bright open clap sound with a bit of width, and a bit more of a he, um, a sound there with a bit more body. It sounds like a 707 or something, um, some kind of analog drum machine. 
And those two are basically playing together to the first one provides the kind of brightness um, and intensity and the second one provides the body and the punch. So here's the lower one. And those two, so the, those two samples are used to kind of because they complement each other. So they're they're working in different frequencies in different areas of the frequency spectrum. So they're kind of supporting each other. Uh, next up, got this groove clap. So that's just playing after every second, um, every third kick drum. So it just provides a bit of groove, a bit of shuffle with the kick, with the other claps. So it just kind of creates this rolling um, feeling in the drums. Next up, I've got this snare sound, which is just creating a fill. Um, so I've got that happening like a short fill every four bars and then a longer fill every eight bars. So that's just helping to kind of keep the drums turning around and sounding interesting um, and kind of indicate that it, so it'll, it plays here before the um, before everything drops back in after this break. Next up, we've got the hats. Hats sound like this. Again, really simple, um, just providing a groove to go with this main um, theme of the track. Everything is building around that main that main theme. So what have we got here? We've got a, a closed hat playing eighth notes in a kind of classic disco style. Um, it's just it's really simple. A um, little bit quieter on the downbeat, a little bit louder on the upbeat, and there's one little shuffle here which is just kind of stopping it sound, sounding boring by being 100% repetitive, basically. Uh, next up, we've got this nice rough open hat, taking that from a open hat loop and cut out the very low frequencies. Um, because there's not so many hats in this track, um, I've actually left in quite a lot of the mids and it just helps that hat to sound big and solid and punch through. Um, if it was a, if the track had a lot more going on in the percussion, I might actually cut that, cut quite a lot more out of that. But in this case, that just makes it sound a bit too thin. Now I've got a. Top loop there, um, just adding a bit of interest and groove really. Um, you see it's got a few sixteenth notes playing and that's it's quite quiet in the mix so what it's adding is it's just kind of filling out the drums a little bit. It doesn't have a lot of character or attitude, it's just kind of filling out a little bit of the groove. So it just adds a small amount of shuffle and um, additional texture to the to the groove. Very quiet in the mix. Um, now I've got some rides.
big gritty open ride sound and that's just used to pick up energy here after the after the break <laughs> So it just really helps to keep things flowing in the track and kind of just like everything, it's just kind of helping the flow, helping to push things through to different sections um, and create tension and release. I've got next this, I've called it brushy hat. What is this? Right, so it's another really gritty open hat sound. Um, and by the looks of things it's doing basically the same thing as the ride but it's just providing an alternative um, texture to keep things interesting basically it's it's acting exactly as a ride symbol would um, but just with a slightly different texture now in the percussion Right, so there's just a short, simple bongo loop with a little 16th um, closed hat or tambourine sound. I'm not too sure exactly what it is. Also quite low in the mix, so I'll just play that first without it and then turn it on. You can kind of hear how low that's mixed. And it's just adding again a bit more texture and a bit more groove. So that's the drums, really simple but effective. The takeaway from that, I would hope, is that it doesn't need to be complicated. Um, depending on the track, it's the most important thing is the end result, and um, the the elements should work to support each other and to kind of create the final outcome. Now all those drums I bust together so that I can process them. Um, first of all, I'm, it's so that I can kind of filter them um, as one section, as like a drum section. So in this, for example, in this breakdown here, So just pulling out the highs from that and allows me to do that more simply than putting a um, uh, putting a, a filter onto each channel. Now, what I'll do turn all I'll turn all of these off and show you what you, what each element is doing. So first up we've got a Slate Digital Virtual Mix Rack and I've got the Hollywood Virtual Tube Collection console here. Um, that's basically just adding some saturation to the drums. Very subtle, um, maybe if I play it without the kick it's easier to hear what's happening. So it just brightens up the highs a little bit and kind of helps everything gel together. Um, next up I've got a compressor here, Slate Digital VBC Grey. And this is just adding a bit of light compression to kind of um, duck any, any peaks in the drums that are anything that's popping out too high and kind of make everything a bit more balanced. So that's just really catching the peaks of like those open hats or the, when the when the rides or the 
brushy hat to playing. Um, it's going to build up a lot of energy. When that volume builds up, it's just going to pull it back a, a bit. And it's pretty subtle, up to about 3 dB, I think. Yeah, so just 2 to 3 dB. And I've got a little bit of makeup gain, which is just helping push all of the other elements up in the mix. Now the next thing I've got here is another compressor which is adding some parallel compression. Now the settings on the compressor are really slamming the, the drums, but I'm only using 25% of that wet mix. Um, I'll show you what it sounds like with the full compression. So it's a bit crazy and overdone. Then I'll bring it into the 25% and you can kind of see that it just adds some glue and some warmth and kind of helps some of the like 16th swing notes to sit up a bit more loud in the mix and everything to kind of sound a bit more present. So it's subtle again, but when I, when I turn it on and off, you can just hear that it, the drums kind of lift up and become a bit more, um, they kind of jump out of the mix a little bit more. The next thing I've got here is a bit of light distortion or saturation coming from the Sound Toys Decapitator. And again, that's just adding like a final little bit of glue to the um, to the drums to help everything sit together as one unit. Now, all of those all of those plugins are really subtle, but together they kind of add up to create quite a difference in the drums. So I'll play it without that group, and then I'll turn it on, and you'll really see that the drums kind of become a lot brighter and they are really kind of gelled together. I'm using a send to send that to some room reverb. Bring up the return channel here. Now I'm sending all of the drums to that reverb as one for the exact same reason that the reverb is being applied to all of the drums, it's a room reverb, and the idea is to make it sound like they're all in the same room. So that's just the sound of the reverb playing by itself. And there's the drums with the reverb. Without So it doesn't add like it's just, it's just, it's a very subtle change, but like I said, it's just to make it sound um, make everything sound cohesive and together. What I'm using for that is a Slate Digital Verb Suite Classic because that's being used in ascend. I've got the dry wet up to 100%. Yeah, it's a short short room reverb. This is a convolution reverb unit, so that uses, um, it's basically modeled on the sound of a old analog reverb unit, I think. What I'm doing to that is cutting out all of the sub and the low mids, as I don't want that um, those frequencies being doubled up and to, and muddying up the mix. Then what I'm doing now, this is quite interesting, I'm side-chaining the reverb, the drum reverb from the drums themselves. So what this is doing is the reverb's playing and then the drum, when the drums actually play, it's getting ducked out of the way. It's all slightly lowered in volume. And that just helps the drums to punch through. But then, when the when the initial drum sound stops, the sound of the the volume of the reverb increases again, 
and it helps to create the atmosphere. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get this these atmospheric sounding drums, but still really punchy. Now let's have a look at the melodic elements of the track. Okay, first up I've got this disco stab. That's just a sample from the original track. What I've done to it is used an envelope on this simpler to make it a bit more short and stabby. It's obviously got a kick drum or something underneath there, so I've taken out um, all of the sub and low mids. So it sounds a bit more, it almost sounds like it's got a kind of vocal char characteristic to it. I'm using this auto filter to transition it throughout the mix. So that's where the top's cut off. There it's more bright, so that just helps it to, f to flow with the rest of the elements in the track. I'm sending that to a delay, which is just a Ableton. I think that's, it says three, but I'm pretty sure that is a dotted eighth note. Now, next up, I've got a string. High string, um, which is coming from the Roland JV1010. Really great, super cheap um, old synth unit with lots and lots of classic Roland sounds in there. Can't recommend that enough. I think it's about 90 euros on, is what I paid for it off eBay. There's a phaser on that, which is just helping it to So that's pretty standard sounding. The phaser basically just makes it sound a bit more interesting. Next up I've got this disco loop, which I think I, which I think I've taken from another record, um, another disco record which is in the same key. And Basically, I've sampled that and cut out all of the low frequencies and kind of EQ'd it and chopped it together, resampled it. A bit of compression, LFO tool again to duck it away from the kick, some eighth note delay with a ping pong, just to kind of give it a bit of width, set it in the mix, and then again a filter just to bring it, um, which is automated, just to bring it up and down in the mix. So that works really well with the um, filtered bass. exactly the vibe I'm going for and that's just another texture to kind of to kind of keep things interesting keep things changing up now we've got the vocal section two thing two elements here so that's coming from the original track um, you heard it in the full sample that I played at the start. So I've just used an envelope to cut out the end of that so that it fades out after this uh, after the vocal has played. Again cutting out the sub frequencies, a bit of light compression, the side chain and I've got another delay on there which is ping pong quarter notes and what that's doing is it kind of it creates the atmosphere again but it also helps to extend the sample out so that it kind of the sound of it plays a bit longer 
it's got quite a high, quite a high feedback and the dry wet's set quite high so it's playing quite a lot of the wet sound of the of the delay which just helps to basically make that vocal sound carry on a bit longer so you can see the the vocal actually kind of stops here but it's with the delay it continues on playing until the drop here Also worth mentioning there is, um, I think, a piece I've chopped from another section of the track, the original track, which just provides a little fill as before the um, kick and the bass come back in. Next up in the vocal section, I've got this little chop. And that's, um, so that's playing uh, just the start of this vocal, of this vocal sample. And um, it's play, it looks like it's playing on the claps with a little shuffle at the end um, every four bars. Now, that's just kind of, it, it's just a texture that sits on top. It's not you wouldn't really notice that it's there or that it's not there um, but it, again all these little things just add up to keep things interesting um, <clears throat> so it's not making or breaking the track at all at all but it um, it just helps to kind of keep things interesting add another little dynamic layer to the track that can kind of come in and out and make sections feel unique to each other now we've got some effects nice splashy crash with some delay on it which is playing every eight bars pretty much through most of the track and that's just um, again similar to the um, snare fill it's just kind of signaling that something's going to happen and just keeping things interesting keeping each of those uh, drum phrases turning over really low in the mix um, it's just subtle but there's another crash here which has got a lot more reverb, it's a lot more dynamic um, it's got a lot more layers to it and I think that's just out of a sample pack um, yeah so there's a lot more going on in that sound and that's quite a lot louder in the mix and that I'm using that on the drop when the kick and the bass comes back in to create an emphasis on that moment in the track next up we've got this analog pitch so that's quite like a bright glassy um, pitching filter sweep sound um, <clears throat> and basically I think that was I just found it and thought it was a cool interesting layer that fit quite well with the rest of the track yeah so it just kind of um, fills in some space and creates a bit of interest um, it's not a main feature of the track but it really just helps to transition as you heard into that short break and to kind of 
keep um, the listener interested and keep things happening in the track. I've got this LFO riser. It happens once in the main break. Short, quirky four bar sound there, which just kind of it has the same kind of fun vibe as the rest of the track and it just helps to build up energy at that at that main before the main drop there. Okay, additionally, I've got this panning riser, which is doing the same thing. So that's just panning side to side and pitching up in, um, in frequency. It's really, really low in the mix and it's just providing a bit of ear candy on the sides. Of really low in the mix, but um, it just, it, it's subtle, but it adds, adds something, adds, keeps things interesting. Right, so it's just kind of a um, <clears throat> pitching filter sweep sound um, that's kind of increasing in length and it's got some delay being and reverb being added to it and it just kind of builds up. Um, what I've done here, added a fade to the sample, so without the fade I think it's, it starts dramatically. Um, it, but I wanted it to kind of build up to act more like a riser effect. So I've added that. Um, now the way to do that, you select the part of the sample that you want to fade. Command Alt F. And that just adds in the fade. Really cool sound, only plays a couple of times in the track and again just keeps things interesting, goes with that kind of fun disco vibe of the main sample. In the, in the writing process for me the, the important thing was like I had an idea of what I wanted for the track and I, I knew where I was going from the start which allowed me to work really quickly and to, to select elements quickly that I that I thought would um, would support that main theme. Okay, now I will show you the master bus. Now, one thing I'm using is a virtual summing so it's a virtual analog summing um, mixer. This is from Slate Digital also. Um, now what happens here is on each of these groups, effects, vocals, melody, and then these two buses, the drums and the kick and bass, I've got a virtual mix rack which has the Slate Virtual Channel Console plugin on in it. These are each set to Group One, which means that all of them are being summed to the same group. Then on the master, I've got the same thing, but with the mix bus version. So it's receiving the signal from all of those other. Um, virtual console collection channels and they're all being grouped together here and that allows me to um, control the volume and add some drive to this. Now what this is doing is it's emulating um, an old classic console. I'm, I always use the Brit 4KE which is an emulation of the SSL E-channel console. Um, 
the Brit 4G is an emulation of the SSL G channel. Um, and there's various other ones there. I think the Brit N is a Neve console. Um, but yeah, they're all modeled on um, famous analog mixing discs. And what this does is just kind of provides a bit of, let's call it, mix glue. Um, it's one of those pretty arbitrary terms that's kind of thrown around. Um, but I'll, sh I'll play it with and without, and you can kind of hear for yourself what it does. So it just kind of provides a bit of warmth and fatness in the bottom end, a bit of brightness and width to the tops. These Slate digital plugins, um, I can't recommend them enough, but they are kind of expensive. I think it's about 180 euros a year for a subscription service. Now, moving on. Now, the, with as far as mastering goes, I'm not by any means a pro. Um, I have all my all of my tracks mastered by someone else, but I want to be able to test my tracks out in the club before they go to that mastering through that mastering process. So all I'm really doing here is getting them up to a um, industry standard loudness. Now I do that using two limiters. The first one is the Waves L2 here. <laughs> which is just knocking off um, about one and a half to two dBs. Um, now the real limiting is being done by this FabFilter Pro L2. So that's just bringing the overall volume of everything up, um, kind of push, squashing the tops of the transients a little bit. But I've got the settings here um, to try and preserve as much of the punch as I can. So the reason I'm adding that limiting is to get it to an industry standard loudness so that I can play it alongside tracks that, I, that you would buy off Beatport in my DJ sets. Now next here we've got a plugin which I really find super handy. Um, it's called the Oscillos Megascope, and I can't recommend this enough. I think it's about uh, somewhere between like twenty and fifty euros. And what it does is basically creates a visual waveform output of your track uh, of in real time of what's being played. <laughs> Now, when you're mixing, I think the most important thing is to use your ears, but this just provides another, um, like a visual cue to see, um, to give you another layer of feedback. Let me play the kick drum and say this FM bass. So I'm listening to headphones right now, so it's not um, super easy to get an idea of the relative um, volume of those elements. But by using the Oscillos Megascope, I can see how loud the bass is compared to the volume of the kick drum. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that. Hopefully you found it interesting and I was able to convey some of those techniques and uh, you were able to learn something from that. Let me know in the comments if there was anything that I just breezed over and you would like to know more information about or if there is any other topics that you'd like me to cover in future videos. 
maybe there's a specific track that you'd like me to do a similar walkthrough with or maybe there's an element from one of my tracks that you'd like me to explain how I created it or another production principle concept technique that you'd like more information on I'm going to be doing more of these so again let me know in the comments what you would like to see and let's try and make that happen make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so that youtube lets you know every time i've uploaded a new video make sure you follow me on instagram at dilby dj for updates on new music gigs and everything else that's coming up all right that's everything from me today thanks for tuning in peace and stay safe <laughs>